these three girls appear perfectly normal. They do perfectly normal things. But there is something very puzzling about them. I don't think I could explain what's going on, really. People ask, well, where did it come from? Well, who knows? Who knows? We certainly don't. They have selective mutism. They can speak, but with most people, they don't. I think, well, is there something wrong with me? It is heartbreaking. They can't go on not talking. How can you have a relationship with a child who won't speak to you? And she wants to do it. She wants to be the same as everybody else. But to speak a single word to those they love can seem impossible. Are you ready to talk now? Selective mutism isn't easy to make sense of. Red is eight. Most people never hear her talk, but she's found other ways to get her point across. What sort of things do you like? I don't think I could explain what's going on, really. Like all good parents, we've tried uh, bribery and corruption. We'll take you to the park if you talk at school today. If you answer the register, we'll buy you a chocolate bar. She has a set of rules for who she can and can't speak to. These rules are different for every selectively mute child. Red talks normally with her mum and dad, but many of her relatives have never heard her. She has a best friend she will chatter happily to. What's three lots of 200? But she never ever speaks in school. Selective mutism, the, the formal definition of it is consistent failure to speak in certain social situations. Most of them are fine with um, immediate family, but each of these children um, have their own pattern of who they can speak to and who they can't. But the pattern is baffling. There is no rhyme or reason to their silence. Ten-year-old Megan goes cheerleading every Thursday, but she doesn't ever cheer. Five, six, seven, eight. The only place Megan really speaks openly is at home with her family. But not when anyone else is there, especially not a documentary film crew. What's it normally like? Yeah. Noisy. Really noisy. And if you weren't here now, she would be saying, oh, they've got a bigger bit than me, or... <laughs> could, could I make you speak, maybe, if I tried hard enough, do you think? It often comes over that these children are just doing it deliberately, they're just putting it on. But in fact, they couldn't maintain it for its intensity or for its persistence. There are children who have broken limbs and they haven't cried. There might be a silent tear, but there's no movement, no, no cry for help. Um, they just could not maintain it that long if, if this was um, deliberate. Can you talk? You can talk, but you don't talk. Why don't you talk, Red? It's hard to explain, but even harder for those that Red doesn't speak to. Red's granddad, John, and his partner, Eileen, love to have their granddaughter to stay. But in the eight years since she was born, they haven't heard her utter a word. Obviously, heard her cry as a baby, as, as sort of parents and grandparents do. Um, but when it comes to actually talking, nothing, ever. That's it. Grandad might not hear much from Red, but he still sees her regularly. She looks forward to visiting his Yorkshire home. Hello! Hello. Come on in, come on in. Are you all right? Hello, sweetheart. Like, yeah, yeah. 
Are they new glasses? <laughs> Are they different ones? I've got no explanation for it as such. It's nothing that we've done sort of mentally, physically or anything else to it. All we've ever shown is a love and affection. Right, now here we go. Faced with a silent granddaughter... You wouldn't want to go far in this, would you? John hasn't stopped talking. Sounds like an engine, doesn't it? And talking. Look at that big bird there. What is it? Is it a swan? And talking. Would you like to go on the train? It'd be a lot easier than this, wouldn't it? But after eight years of constant chatter, he's getting a little bit tired. Are you putting any effort into this? She'll nod or, or shake her head, you know, no, I don't want this, yes, I do want that. And she'll communicate in all other ways other than talking. How are you getting on at school? Are you top of the class? And what's your favourite thing you do at school? Spell it out on there. Maths. Poor old Gwendaz doing all the work again. It is difficult and frustrating. You know, you you want to pick her up and shake her and say, "Talk to me," but you know you can't because that would do nothing. Although she looks a confident and happy little soul, surprisingly, Red finds the thought of speaking to Grandad and most other people strangely scary and stressful. Well, I think the best way to understand selective mutism is to think of it as a phobia. This very real, intense fear of talking to somebody or somebody hearing your voice. All those children are doing is controlling their own anxiety. By not speaking, they're removing themselves from the stress. But coping with a girl who can speak but doesn't is painful, especially when she's your only grandchild. I think, well, is there something wrong with me? Is it me? Is it, you know, and I, it is heartbreaking. It's not too strong a word to use. It is heartbreaking. The family have decided they need help to get Red talking to her granddad. How can you have a relationship with a child who won't speak to you? So, um, and I think the older she gets, the harder it's going to be. Just hoping and praying that one day she'll get over this condition and she will talk freely like a normal child. But starting to talk isn't easy when you've avoided it for as long as you can remember. Selective mutism usually begins very early in life. Megan's parents believe her problem started on a holiday swimming trip, when Megan was just four. She spoke to somebody in the water thinking it was me. She got so upset, She's, I've never seen anybody so upset. She was like sobbing and she was really upset and she was really strange on that holiday. If she got out of my sight, she panicked. It was like a real panic attack. Her heart would bump faster. If she sat on your lap, you could feel her heart go boom, 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 like that, so it's weird. Selective mutism often seems to be triggered by such everyday incidents. These are just normal life events that most of us would cope with, but if you are of this anxious disposition anyway, it's much, much worse. And in the height of this distress, they come to associate it with talking. Everyone nice and quiet for us to do the register, please. Oliver. When Megan Aaron. started school, the anxiety about speaking didn't go away. Jade. Mr Lockerbie is her class teacher and he's never Melissa. heard her say a word. Megan? Well, at times, she could become almost invisible in the class. Okay, she never volunteers, she never puts her hand up. Very, very difficult to communicate with her and to know what she's trying to communicate to me. I really do think she's got a lot to give. It comes out of the page 
um, it would just be nice for it to come out of her mouth. Do you think she'll ever speak to you? I hope so. I really do. But I'm not expecting it. So I'm not holding my breath. Megan will soon leave the shelter of her primary school. Before she does, the staff and her parents will make a final attempt to get Megan to talk. People might think, oh, it's a bit funny, they're not talking, but it's serious. She goes to secondary school next year, so I really want her to talk before secondary school. What do you do about getting a job if you can't talk? If you can't communicate, what do you do? How much do you want to speak, Megan? I think she wants to speak a lot, but she can't. I think it annoys you, doesn't it? And do you think one day you will speak? When will that be? Tomorrow. No. <laughs> Monday. How about Monday? If selective mutism isn't dealt with early on, then potentially there are serious consequences. We know of adults who didn't receive the right help when they were children, and they've become either socially anxious, socially phobic, or agoraphobic, completely isolated, dependent on their relatives, and ultimately it's going to lead to depression. Red's family are desperate for her to start talking to her granddad. Tell me what sort of granddad he is. Would you like to be able to talk to your granddad? And do you, do you think you will? But selective mutism isn't common, and it can be difficult to get specialist advice. We put the family in touch with speech therapist Maggie Johnson, who has written the most comprehensive guide to treatment. So, if, Caroline, if I could just ask you first, um, just to tell me a little bit about Red in terms of her general character. Well, she's an eight-year-old. She's very typically eight-year-old, very noisy, mm -hmm. a, a, well, a real chatterbox. Yep. Um, and this hasn't been the situation for you, has it, John? Certainly no. That's a shame. That must just feel so hard for it, you. It's, it's hard to put into words, but yeah, it feels hurtful. Yeah, no, I can, it must feel very personal. It, it does, it does. It yeah. feels very, very personal. Uh, you know, as if I've done something wrong, but I haven't done anything wrong. No, 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 absolutely. It's really hard for us to identify with a phobia of talking to friends and family and people who care about you. Often it's the very people that the child wants to speak to the most that they find it the hardest to speak to. Um, and well, that's some consolation. <laughs> oh, it's definitely the case. She might be afraid that she's disappointing you, that um, she's letting you down, that she's disappointing you by not speaking to your dad. And there are all of these thoughts going on in the mind. And in the end, it's easy to say, I'm too busy. Mm. It's just easier to avoid it. But they just Maggie suggests some new ideas the family could try. You know, one good step is um, a talking book. These should help Red to take small steps towards starting to talk. He's having a conversation with you, just knowing that you're on the phone. To reduce Red's anxiety, Grandad is advised to tell Red that he knows how she feels. It's reassurance that you understand that talking for her is actually it's quite scary at the moment, and it's bringing this horrible panic feeling. And you, but you know she's not doing it deliberately. It's just about the general message that you'll get there, and we don't have to talk straight away. We can just communicate just in other ways first. That, yeah. yeah. That you don't mind. It will happen when you're ready. And exactly. I still love you just as much, sort of thing. Exactly. If there's one thing selective mutism demands, it's patience. For the last five years, 
Megan has been looked after at school by a lady called Mrs. Johnson. Megan doesn't talk at school, so Mrs. Johnson has to find other ways for the silent pupil to communicate. Hi, right, how's it been today? Exciting. Her latest speaking aid is a jotter. I quite like this book actually because you've got a really good sense of humour, haven't you, Megan? And we've got Stop Copying Me, which is good. And did it work? Do you enjoy coming to see Mrs. Johnson? That's good to hear. <laughs> Two weeks. Two weeks to your holiday? Mrs. Johnson has never given up asking her questions. But to date, she's never had an answer. But there is a plan. Today, Mrs. Johnson is coming to visit Megan at home. Are you worried about Mrs. Johnson coming today? No? Megan is going to try to talk in front of her. Depends on how Megan deals with it, doesn't it? Scary? You don't know. The operation will be run by Megan's speech therapist, Miriam. After five months' work, she has now heard Megan speak. My aim for this session is to let you hear her voice and maybe towards the end um, feel comfortable maybe answering a few little questions yeah. from you with just a yes or no, looking at you and, and talking to you, even if it's one word. Miriam is employing the same careful approach used to treat phobias. Hello, you are ready? Helping Megan to control her anxiety and, little by little, let new people hear her voice. The only people allowed in the living room will be Miriam, Mum and Megan. But we're going to do everything very, very slowly, just like we did with me. Everybody else has to wait outside the closed door. But Megan has agreed to have two remote controlled cameras in the room. We're going to start with some really easy things. It's quite exciting. Right, okay, I'll start. One, three, Five, seven, nine. Can you hear anything, Carol? The procedure moves on to stage two, the opening of the door. OK, and we're going to have this door ajar. And you can just stay on the steps. OK, January, March, May. It's a tiny voice, but it can be heard in the hallway. Stage three. Mrs. Johnson joins in from the stairs. One, three, four, six, seven. Stage four, the critical stage. Mrs. Johnson will now enter the room. A, C, I, K, M, O, Q, S. Megan, what colour's the sun? That was a huge step. I yeah, think it went well. Yeah, it went really well. Fantastic. It brought a tear to my eye, <laughs> Miriam. It really did, because oh. that's, you know, the most we've ever yeah. seen, you know, Megan as Megan. Yeah. Danielle has also been trying to beat selective mutism. Last year, at the age of 14, Danielle was still only speaking to a tiny number of people. 
But then she made a major breakthrough. Can you, you high enough? <laughs> I mean, the last 12 months have been brilliant. You know, to see her now coming on the way she is. Very pro dad. I was in floods of tears. I thought it was fantastic. Seeing the progress that she's made, phenomenal. A year ago, Danielle was still answering questions with a whiteboard. Today, she can just open her mouth and talk. It's like if you're an, if you're a singer and you go on stage for the first time, you get this amazing adrenaline boost. It's like that. And you're like, wow, you know, I'm doing it. And no one will really understand how amazing that really felt. Like other children, Danielle fell into the grip of selective mutism when she was very small. You can tell that I'm not comfortable. Obviously, my mouth is tight shut there. Her family tried everything, but they couldn't get their only child to talk. I remember thinking I'm special, but as I got older then, I realised it wasn't special. It was just different in a bad way. So why didn't you just start talking? It was the mental block. It's because it's not like you physically can't talk. No, it's, it feels like you physically can't talk. That's how it feels. Oh, it was a hard, hard 11 years. You know, and it puts an awful lot of strain on, on everything. The family relationships, you know, you'll you find, because of the frustrations the child has, um, they, they can get aggressive, verbally and physically, and we've had both. When she reached secondary school, Danielle still wasn't speaking to staff or pupils. The stress turned the daily school run into a traumatic business. She'd physically have symptoms of sickness, headaches, sweating hands, a little verbally aggressive. Um, we used to have a bit of a punching session sometimes. And it's just horrible anxiety. It was just, ugh, horrible. Why do scientists think it's expanding? What's the evidence they may suggest? Danielle came up with her own drastic solution. She asked to move to another school, where nobody knew about her problem. She thought it might be possible to talk, providing she could start the moment she arrived. I walked in the door, I, I met the school secretary, I said, this is Danielle, and Danielle said hello. And I was like, I can believe it. And I said to my mum that I'd never felt so free. And I was like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was amazing. And it was so natural. Danielle is now much more confident about talking. But after avoiding speech for over a decade, her behaviour was deeply ingrained. She's still struggling to completely rid herself of her fear. Yeah, it's, it's not all over yet. Yeah, there's quite a few things I still can't do, like obviously talking on the phone, all that sort of thing, going into shops, restaurants. It's still, it's still part of my life. So what's your aim? To just talk to everyone. <laughs> Be normal, if you like. Normal. Gotta be 15-year-old kill. <laughs> As spring moves towards summer, everyone is working on the first tiny steps forward. There are no shortcuts with selective mutism unless you start to nip it in the bud between sort of two and four years of age. You've got to be prepared for it to be a fairly slow but steady process. Those children have to work really hard at dealing with this and, and really breaking this barrier down but their efforts are beginning to show some results. On Maggie's suggestion, Red has made a present for Grandad, with a magical surprise inside. The built-in voice recorder means she can let him start to hear her voice. I love eating fruit salad. I can swim 10 metres from my front and back. <laughs> it might not be conversation. I am also learning to play drums. But for Grandad, these are Red's first words. I love Agatha Christie's mystery stories. Inspector Poirot. <laughs> the end. Well, <laughs> that is absolutely fantastic, isn't it? And you said all of that? That is brilliant. 
You can be a right little chatterbox, can't you? And do you know how much I love you? That much. And that's a lot, isn't it? It doesn't matter that you don't talk to me. It's not important, is it, really? Because we still love you just as much. But one day, maybe, In Dover, the same slow, creeping progress is underway. All right, are you both okay? Yeah. Megan's class teacher, Mr Lockerbie, can now join in the strange ritual of Megan's therapy sessions. One, two, three, four, five, six. I hope I don't muck it up when I get inside, do something stupid and upset the whole proceedings. One. Let's start again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 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 the voice was just so sweet and amazing. And you think this is a normal thing that everybody normally does and she's not doing it. Um, when, she, when she did it, it was normal and it felt right. Mr Lockerby said he liked it because he hadn't ever heard Megan before. And Megan, how did you feel about it? It seems some people are still off limits. Bums up, bums down <laughs> in the middle. Although Danielle has come a long way in the last year, she's still working to completely free herself from selective mutism. Even now, she avoids everyday tasks like shopping because she worries about unexpected conversation. What would happen? I just get very sweaty palms, just heart would race, it would be another panic that makes me. It may seem absurd, but after years of not speaking, even buying a chocolate bar still triggers an irrational fear. But today, Danielle is determined to overcome it. I want to try and get over the anxiety. I want to try and show to myself that I can do normal things. And I'm not just some um, kid that can't do anything, right? And how are you feeling about it? I'm scared. Danielle's decided there's strength in numbers. She's brought along her mum and a friend in case she gets into difficulties. You ready for this? No. <laughs> Just go for it. Oh. With her mind on the till and the talkative women behind it, it seems hard for Danielle to focus on chocolate. Cadbury's there. Mm. Poppets. Maynards. Go on then. Just pick anything. You can dark brandy then. Thanks, Mum. Yeah. All right. Should we walk around then and just walk, go walk to the coffee counter? Towards the wine. Yeah. Queuing for service only adds to the stress. Selective mutism isn't always easy to escape. Danielle's failure is a painful setback. You did well going in. Yeah, all right, all right, all right, all right. Tell me what happened. No. Give me five. 
it's awful because I, I get churned up because I can see what she's coming through, you know, and it's really hard. I really would have liked her to have been able to do it, but I, one minute I looked at her face, I knew she couldn't. I just knew she couldn't. And I, could, I felt quite upset to see her so upset. Sorry. And she wants to do it. She wants to be the same as everybody else. And, and we both want her to do that. Where am I? You seemed quite angry. Can you yeah. explain what was yeah. making you angry? Um, that was just because I couldn't buy anything else because I just couldn't do it. The anxiety's preventing me and the anxiety's not nice at the best of times. When it stops you from doing something you want to do, it's, especially buying chocolate, it just, it just really annoys me. I don't want it. I don't need it. You know, I, there's stuff I want to do and I don't want the anxiety hanging over me all the time. Since the first time Megan spoke in front of her class teacher, things have gone rather quiet. It's now seven weeks later, and despite regular therapy sessions, Mr Lockerbie is having a problem striking up conversation with Megan. She's never answered me straight to my face, even doing the register. I look up at her and she still looks at me and she doesn't move her mouth at all. I think it's going to take longer than I initially thought. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot harder for her than I think it is, or I think than we all think it is, and there's a lot more anxiety there. In an attempt to move things forward, Megan's speech therapist, Miriam, has come up with a bold plan. Megan is going to reveal her fears about speaking to her entire class and ask for their help. Okay, so this is Megan in her own words. This is what she really wants you to know about her and her difficulties. Unsure of the reactions she might receive, Megan has decided to stay outside while Miriam reads her message out. So she's called this My Story. As you know, my name is Megan and I'm 10 years old. When I was very young, I developed a fear of speaking in public. This worry got worse and worse until it became a habit. Over the years, the habit has stuck and I find I can only speak with certain people. Like all habits, this one is very hard to break. Each time I try to speak, I get the same worry feeling that I felt all those years ago. I really want to get over this, but I need your help. I'd like you to treat me just the same as anyone else and talk to me like any of your friends. If I don't say much at first, please don't give up and it will get easier and easier for me. Thank you for listening and thank you for trying to understand, okay? How do you feel about Ma Megan now? Well, she's not like a monster and she's not gonna like, say bad things, she's just going to be not really, she's be a bit quieter than everyone else. Um, I've got Megan's email address and we like chat over the internet and that. And she asked me questions and I, I quite enjoy that. That's it's, fantastic. It's actually really fun. Have you ever tried to come in and kind of No, chat? not yet, but well, I, am, I am going to try. Yeah, good, yeah. you try that. I think that hopefully could it's funny, be a nice it's thing. It's funny, Miriam, because, because I've taught Megan for a long time and I suppose it's the children have known. I mean, we've got into a habit of yeah. not talking to Megan. So we need to change our habits, in a way, uh, just by, you know, saying the odd word to her here and there. Red's mum has her own cunning plan to put into action. The girl who hardly speaks to a soul is about to get a rather unlikely present. Hello, Hiya. good morning. Hiya. Hiya. Yes, thank you. Um, We'd like to find a little mobile phone for my daughter here. Maggie Johnson has suggested that Red could use a mobile phone to start to talk to Grandad by leaving him voicemail. Yeah, did you want to have a look? So you can have a go at sliding it. Yeah. But the prospects aren't great. She's never been particularly comfortable around a phone, but then I guess that's because the whole point of it is you speak and you listen. She's occasionally picked it up accidentally and then not been able to speak and hung up. 
Grandad has driven down from Yorkshire for a visit. Boom! He's come to put Operation Mobile Phone into action. Oh, you okay? Good, good, good. If their plan works, Grandad and Granddaughter would have the means to start to communicate. Wow, we. Eh? Well, that's a posh one, isn't it, with a slider? So that means you could phone me and you could leave me a message. Red is persuaded to try out the phone as long as Grandad is a long way away. A very long way away. But a grandparent must be ready to go to extraordinary lengths to beat this extraordinary condition. I'll give you a couple of minutes to get back. Hang on, hang on, I haven't finished yet. I'll give you a couple of minutes to get back. <coughs> then I'll phone you, but don't answer me. And I'll leave you a message. Then you can listen to my message. And then you can phone me, and I can listen to your message that you leave for me. Right. Ready, steady, go. Careful. So, here we go. Let's see if we can do this. We're ringing. Hi, Red. Um, this is message number one. I'm down the end of the garden. And I'd just like to say that I'm really happy to be here and seeing you again today. OK, bye. Fingers crossed. Come on, Red. We have a call here. Hopefully she's now leaving me a message. At the moment. And now we have a message. This is going to be fantastic. First one ever. Four words, it's great having you here. That is absolutely brilliant. That is a step. She's never, ever phoned me, never, ever spoken to me on the phone. Never would. That is a big, big step. It works. Did you get my message? Yeah, it works. That's a brilliant idea, isn't it? Yep. So now you'll be able to phone me up and then I'll think, who's phoning me now? And then I'll look, I think, oh, it's Red, she's left me a message. That's really, really pleased me, that. Well done. Right, shall we go and uh, tell Mummy that worked and we'll try it and let Mummy listen to it, okay? A lump came in my throat, to be quite honest, and I, I was sort of initially having to compose myself. You know, you just sort of, hold yourself together but you know I was I was leaping up and down inside you're waiting eight years nearly nine years for this it doesn't sink in you can't believe that it's happening uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the starting up of the phone calls now that is what I'm looking forward to still determined to shake off selective mutism Danielle has set herself another challenge because she never spoke at her old school, bizarrely, Danielle's oldest friends have still never actually heard her talk, a problem she's now planning to tackle. How big a thing will it be to talk to your friends? Um, well, it'll mean a lot. It'll mean a lot to them and me. Because like, we'll be able to you know, have a laugh and everything without me you know, being the quiet one, even though I did have a good laugh with them then as well. Dan would like to go out more with her friends and do things, and I'd like her to do that, because it'll open up her social skills as well. Um, but not being able to talk to the friends she wants to be with makes that difficult. 
friends. Oh, oh my God. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. But there is one friend from her old school that Danielle does talk to. Oh, that's a nice one. Bethan is Danielle's oldest friend. She's always had to act as translator with the rest of the group. After a long period of time, I pick up on yeah. actions that she did, which would signal me to... Yeah. You had to be, like, my spokesperson, if you like, didn't you? Yeah. You had to talk for me. It, it, it just, just works. works. It's hard to explain. It just, it just clicks. Bethan's going to organise the Friends reunion. But after years of silence, what on earth do you say? I don't know how this but it's kind of embarrassing when you suddenly start talking to someone. Oh, I'm so afraid like if I go in and say, Oh, you know, hello to them all or something just something just something normal yeah. that normal people would do, they'd be yeah, it would be a party, wouldn't it? They'd be completely high. The day dawns and Danielle is ready to attempt another step forward. She and Bethan await the arrival of their old friends, Harriet and Nicole. If that's not one of them. Oh, I don't think so. I'm hoping now, because of our age, they'll be more mature and obviously not jump about and scream, which, I mean, when you carry Nicole, you can't guarantee that they do that spontaneously anyway. <laughs> The friends haven't seen each other for months. And the reunion is a cheery affair. <laughs> anyway, how are you? But Danielle's mouth stays tightly closed. <laughs> At lunch, she's still stuck in her familiar old silence. It's really funny when all the boys around. Chris is always making fun of me. By the time her friends start discussing boys, Danielle's urge to speak seems to have deserted her completely. No, she knows everything about Tom, by the way. Yeah, I don't, don't worry. worry. <laughs> I don't get it. Don't worry. Dan's in his Holton's class last year. I didn't have a clue what they were on about. They're going out, they, you know, going down the park and whatever with these boys, and, and they're nagging me to go out with them. But if I go out, I'm not going to talk, and these boys are going to think I'm an idiot. So, you know, I can't do that. And then the way they're together, it's just like those three and then me. Danielle's friends are making the most of teenage life. But when you don't speak to people, it's hard to keep up. I'm losing my friends. So either I'm not normal or they're not normal. And I've got the feeling that I'm not normal. For Megan, it's almost the end of the school year. She's got a spring in her step, and it's not just the idea of the summer holidays ahead. OK, answer your names, please. Matthew. After six months Bradley. and 23 therapy sessions, Bethany. in Mr Lockerbie's classroom, something miraculous Ethan. has started to happen. Caitlin. Yeah. Megan. Have you seen any change in Megan? Yeah, yeah. She's, she's, to she is, she's talking a lot. Yeah, more. she's talking. Yeah. She's been more confident of talking in front of the class. What is your favourite type of sweet? Kieran? Sherbet lemons and wine gums. Mm, it's greedy as well. And Megan? Cola bottles. Cola bottles. You know, the minute that, that hand goes up, you know, you're drawn to her because it's not something she's ever done before. Um, so I think that's a really, really positive thing. Um, and she's smiling a lot more. So have you spoken to Megan? Yes. Yeah, she's been doing a lot of applying. And were you surprised to hear her voice? Yes. So are you finding it easier to answer people now, Megan? Some people, perhaps, but still not everyone. But Megan has one more test before the end of term. 
Next year, Megan won't be taught by Mr Lockerbie anymore. She's going to have to cope with a new class teacher, and she's about to be introduced. OK, everybody, you're here because you're going to be in my class next year. So... But will Megan speak to Mr Cornell? Everybody's got to go in there with the expectation that she's going to do this. How sure are you? Oh, ask me in another ten minutes and I'll let you know. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to just go round and we're going to say our names first, aren't we? Two names, OK? My name's Billy. My name's Matthew. My name's Billy. My name's Sophie. My name's Nikki Jones. My name's Millie. My name's Millie. My name's Nikki. I'm nine. I'm ten. I am ten and three quarters. I'm eleven. I'm ten. I'm ten. In Wales, Danielle's social life is improving. Inside jokes. <laughs> She's made friends in her new school that she does speak to. She's not giving up. I could just say, oh, I'm never going to get married, never going to have a boyfriend. Forget that. I'll let everyone else have them and I'll just sit back and chill. But, you know, what's the point in that? I think I'll always be anxious over certain situations. But I'll just keep going and, yeah, hopefully. Just keep going and get over it all. Further north, Red and her granddad have finally begun a rather unconventional conversation through Red's voicemail messages. You'll have to leave a message and let me know what you're going to do today. I'm going out to the bars to do canoeing and swimming today. So you went in a canoe, did you? Oh, I've never been in a canoe. That's really good. I bet that was exciting. They've added a new dimension to the relationship. It's sort of opened up a, a new world. Ready? It worked. Happy birthday, Granddad. I've never had you wish me happy birthday before. It was lovely, thank you. All, all grandparents probably get that and think nothing to it. But, you know, I've waited until she's nine before she's felt confident enough to say, Happy birthday, Grandad. And, you know, she could have bought me a Ferrari, but that meant nothing to that. Let's see if you can go up with it, buddy. <laughs> we are at last moving forward. And, and that from 12 months ago is absolutely fantastic. Step by step. They are all making progress, but it's always those first words that are the hardest. What's your name? Megan. And how old are you, Megan? Ten. Have you enjoyed having us filming you? You can see I don't know if you don't know. I don't know. 